Are you ready for the word? Let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you, we worship you, we honor you today, and we just thank you for all the things you are doing in our lives. We choose to set our affection, our focus, according to the alignment of your word, to what you are saying, what you are doing. We thank you, Father God. I speak over these people today, and I decree, declare, according to your word, that they are men and women of faith, not moved by what they feel, hear, or see, but moved by the revelation and direction of your word, revealed to us by your spirit. I thank you for supernatural strength, wisdom and ability. I thank you, Father God, I, that their eyes, their understanding, let it be open, let each and every one of us receive from heaven what we need to hear today in our place, our journey, our direction of life that comes from you. And Jesus, we vow to give you all the praise and all the glory, and everybody shouted, amen. amen. Habakkuk chapter three, let me look at the screen, or you can turn to it, is a key verse throughout this series we've been doing. It says, the Lord God is your strength. Say, God is my strength. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong. It didn't say feel strong. It said be strong. There's a world of difference between feeling strong and being strong. It's a difference because feelings come and go. Can I get an amen to that? And you can be strong even if you don't feel strong. That's important to know because in the battles of life, that's not the time to test or check how you feel emotionally. Because it's in the battles of life that you will not emotionally, physically feel good. No one feels super spiritual when they're in the battle. Some of us, wait, we only fight when we're feeling super spiritual. And if you only fight when you feel super spiritual, the most important times to fight, you'll be sitting it out. Because it's learning to be strong, not feel strong, but be strong by your identity and your relationship to your heavenly father, not based on how the emotions in the moment, because they come and go. And so the devil will tell you, you you're weak, but you might feel weak. But the Bible says that let those who are weak say, I am strong in the strength of the Lord. So when the devil says you're weak and you feel weak and, and your attention goes to how you feel, you need to rise up and redirect your attention to the word and say, wait a minute, I might feel weak, but I know I'm strong. I might feel broke, but I know I'm rich. I might feel busted and disgusted, but I know I am complete and whole. Why? Because your knowledge of direction comes from revelation and not the information of your emotion. Well, I'll say it and believe it when I feel it. You'll never get there because in the kingdom of God, you have to begin to see by the light of his word, Psalms 119, that the unfolding, the revelation of his word, the, the unfolding of his word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. All of a sudden, in the midst of a storm, I can have peace. In the midst of a battle, I can be strong. Because the Bible tells us that our God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then all I need to know is what and who is he. And if I understand who is he, and there's so many characteristics about the nature of your heavenly father. Jesus put it all in the one context of he's good. What does that mean to you and I? He's good. Well, if you're sick, that means he's good that he's your health. If you're weak, he's good because he's your strength. If you're financially broke, he's good because he is your provider. If you're one, if everything's against you and you have no one for you, he's good because he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. There's more for you than against you. Why? Because he's good. The Lord God is your strength. Say, he's my strength. Notice this, your source of courage, your invincible army. He has made your feet steady and sure like hinds feet and makes you walk forward. Say forward. God doesn't ask you to walk backwards. He asks you to walk forward. Even in correction, even in redirection, even in repentance, it's literally a step forward in destiny. Some people think, well, if I turn around and do it different now, then I'm losing everything. No, 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 no. That stuff, if it's taking the wrong path, don't worry about it. Do the right path and get to the right direction. Do the right path to get to the right direction. If I wanted to go to Florida and I end up going the wrong highway, it doesn't mean I need to pray and fast more to get to the right direction. I just need to get off the, ne the next exit, turn around and do get on the right path to get me to the right direction. It's the right path. It's the right path takes you to the right place. And if you don't know where you're going, then every path is, will work for you. Come on, come on. I don't know where God's taking me. 
Well, if you don't know the promise of the word, that's, don't you understand that even what happened historically in the Old Testament is also symbolic and an example for us in the New Testament. And when God was removing them out of the place of bondage into the place of provision, in the Old Testament, it was called the promised land. Say the promised land. For you and I, it's the place of his provision, the place of his promise. What has he promised you in the covenant of the blood of Jesus? What in that New Testament, that new covenant has been promised to you? Well, I don't know. And guess what you'll get? I don't know. But when you understand that the place of the, the promises given to you of the New Testament is like the Old Testament promised land, and there's a journey. There's a process to get to it. Just because you recognize and God says, I have a promised land for you, and I'm going to defeat your enemies, and I'm going to take you to it. He didn't say, now go on autopilot, fall asleep, and when you wake up, I'll just supernaturally move you over there. And God can supernaturally move people. We see that in the Acts. He picked people up and translated them into a whole other town. But that doesn't mean that's going to work for you that way. Because God doesn't say, I I'm going to bring you to a promised land. Now, Israel, my people, my covenant, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to sleep tonight, and when you come out of your tent, make sure you rub everything out of your eyes and look around because I am going to move you to the place of promise. No. He said, I want you to follow me to the place of promise. I want you to follow me. It's a journey. Say, it's a journey. Come on, shout, it's a journey. Oh, you guys are sounding good this morning. Some of you are all warmed up, ready to go. You're drinking your coffee, your fourth cup. Hallelujah. It's a journey. That's what Hebrews 6.12 says. Be followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promises of God. It's a journey. It's a process. That's what Jesus told the disciples. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I'm going to change your destiny. Follow me and I'm going to redefine who you are. Follow me and I'm going to cause you to be greater than you've ever been in the past. You struggled at catching fish. I'm going to make you successful at catching people. Follow me and I'll move you. Well, he didn't say overnight, bam. He goes, no, you have to follow me. You have to follow me. In our modern day world, we want everything instantaneous. Okay, I prayed twice and it hasn't happened and it's been six hours. Well, if God sometimes give you, gives you everything that his, he has for you in six hours, you know what will be happening in 24 hours? You'll be back to where you were before. Because if you don't learn to trust him and follow him in the process to receive it, you won't learn how to trust him and follow him in the process of managing it. Because getting there is not the end, it's just the beginning of that journey. Oh, I wish the Lord would bless me. I just, well, if you don't know how to handle the hundred dollars, you can't handle the million dollars. Because you think it's a faith process to get there, it's a bigger faith process to stay obedient when you can be moved by your emotions, moved by pressure, moved by people. They say most people, if you, some of you have driven by that lottery sign and said, ooh, Look at that number. If only I could win that. And you start daydreaming. Ooh, I know what I would do. You, you better tie the heathen gambling thing, you. But do you know historically, people who win a, a lottery, large amounts, life-changing amounts, are worse off financially in seven years? Why? Because they thought getting the big money was, would solve all problems, and they didn't realize that there was more responsibility and problems that come with that. And if you don't do it God's way, and if you can't follow the journey God's way, when you get there and they know your name, you get there and they're singing your song, and you get there and they're reading your book, and you get there and they're uh, walking into your business, and you get there, whatever it might be that you define as success, and you get there, if you haven't done it God's way, then all of a sudden you won't learn how to, if you didn't learn how to follow him in the journey to receive it, you won't be able to follow him in the journey to maintain it. Because you will have convinced yourself, you got yourself, oh, I'm a self-made person. And then you find yourself in the self-made situation, crying out, oh, God, how did I get here? All right. It's getting quiet. It's a part of the journey. Yes. And part of that journey, when you walk it through, you need to, as we learn, part of that is learning that God is your strength. God is your strength because you not only have to be able to be strong against opposition that would try to knock you out, you have to be strong against opposition that will try to entice you away. Right, right, 
Where do I get that at? Matthew 13. Look at the, the parable about the sower sowing the word. The first is those who didn't have understanding, and so the birds that Jesus said would come. They didn't get understanding of the word, so the birds, and later you find out it's the devil who eats the word so it doesn't produce any change in the person's life. The second phase is those people who embrace the word. They're glad they receive it with understanding. But because of the pressure that comes from the word's sake, that's the enemy who's trying to talk you out of going forward. That's the enemy that's trying to convince you you just need to stay where you're at. That's the enemy that tries to intimidate you from stepping out of the boat. That's the enemy that's trying to keep you from doing what God's asked you to do. But the Bible says that there are some that when they receive understanding, they begin to start producing and seeing a change from the seed of the word. And all of a sudden, the enemy creates pressure because of the word's sake. And they burn out. Oh, no, you're going to learn. You're not going to burn out. You're not going to give up. You're going to be strong. See, I'm strong. See, we're walking this thing out. It doesn't matter that if you are six foot seven, 300 pounds, ripped, lean, and mean, or if you're just five foot nothing and a hundred and nothing and timid, soft voice. Either way, you have a strength on the inside of you that when the enemy tries to mess with your mind or emotions or people around you, you won't be shaken. You won't be shaken. You won't be shaken. You'll be strong. You'll be strong. You know how you, will, you, know how you can define if you're strong? If someone talks about you or talks against you, or tries to come against you? Do you fall apart? Do you go three days in the room crying on your pillow saying, why me, God? It, you might have, but those days are behind you. Say, th- say to yourself, those days are behind me. You'll have to deal with some giants on the journey. Like I've said before, but don't freak out about that. Because if there weren't giants there in your promised land, by the time you get to the edge of it, every person you know and people you don't know would have already built their their house on your promised land. But when it walks in, and it's your promised land, not somebody else's promised land. See, we got too many people in the church world, if I can go down this road, we got too many people in the church world trying to covet other people's promised land. Oh, if I just was like that, if it was my place, if I did that, if I had that business, it's not your business, it's not your church, it's not your marriage, they're not your kids. If it was me, it's not you. All you're doing is criticizing everybody. No, that's not the role that God, when you understand that you're not called to run every race, but the race Hebrews tells us that's set before you and you have a promised land. You begin to say, wait a minute, I have a promise from God, from heaven that's revealed by the word of God. Therefore, it's not their promise, it's my promise. And if somebody else has a similar promise, praise God that they reach their promised land. And it's not gonna help me to get into their promised land. I don't need to be in their promised land because if I sneak in there and try to be a squatter on their land, I have to keep hiding because any minute someone can find me out and take me out. And listen, when light can find you out and take you out, you're not on the right team. Because only the devil operates in darkness. God operates in light. But when you do it God's way and you're in your promised land that God's called you to be, there will be people saying, I'm going to take it from you. But you won't be nervous because you know the Bible says that the God who brought you is well able to keep you. What do you mean? You're going to kick me out? It's not your house. It's my house. This is my promised land. I'm going to get that job. I'm going to get you fired. You can't get me fired. Not if it's from God. You can't do anything. Don't you realize that the biggest tactic of the devil is to torment your imagination? To steal your peace and your joy? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. If he can get you, if he can get you all stressed out, freaked out, and nervous, you know what? He, does, he can't do anything. But if he can get you so rattled, you'll do it yourself. He'll spin you like a top and step back and just watch you implode, bust up your marriage, break your relationship with your kids, do stupid stuff. Not you anymore, amen? Amen. It's in the journey. It's in the journey. And we're learning. Say, I'm learning. Say, I'm growing. Say, I'm strong in the Lord. So we'll have opposition. But we'll also have, according to Matthew 13, there's a level beyond that. That's when you begin to produce fruit. That means that the word of God is bringing a change in your life. And at that level, it's not the enemy trying to push you back. There's another enemy that will come and try to push you into places you're not called to be. That, that one devil's telling you, you'll never get there. You'll never be healed. You'll never be blessed. No one's ever going to like you. You'll, you'll never have a family. You're never going to get married. You're, and ever, it's never, never, never. The other one starts enticing you. They're lured away, King James says. 
they are enticed. They are enticed away by the shiny. They are enticed away by the offers of the enemy. See, when the devil couldn't get Jesus to stop, what did he do? He took him onto a high mountain and said, look at all of the kingdoms of the world. If you bow down and worship me, I'll, I'll give them to you because I have the right to give them to you. They were given to me and I can give them to you. What was he doing? If he can't stop, he'll try to entice you. Some of you, maybe you're in that journey right now. Things are, you're, you, you're not dealing with the opposition. Now you, the enemy's trying to entice you into areas. Entice you into relationships you, you shouldn't be in. Entice you into places that God never called you to be. If God didn't call you, don't step into it. Because when God calls you, he gives you a grace and anointing ability to do it. If God didn't call you, it might look shiny. It might look close to the destiny. It might similar. I mean, you think about it. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. He came to die on the cross for the sins of humanity. And he knew on the third day he was going to rise again. He came to do the, the business and the will of the Father. He even told his mother as a child, don't you know I'd be about my father's business? It's a business. God, he knew what it was all about. He knew where he was going. He told the disciples before he went to the cross, I'm going to go to the cross. They're going to betray me. I'm going to die. And on the third day, I'm coming back. He said it before and they didn't even understand it. Even when they were walking through it, they didn't even have the understanding that, hey, this is a part of the plan that God was going to pay the price of sin through his son. And that he would be resurrected. And the Bible, according to the New Testament, which we don't find in the gospels, we find out later through the revelation of Paul and that God elevated, gave him a name above every name, yeah. right? Above all principality, above all power, above all dominion, a name, that at that name, every knee should bow, right? So that, that's the position of authority he was going to. So he knew, he knew. In fact, Hebrews tells us to look in unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised in the shame. So he already saw the joy of what the plan of the father was before he was going through the journey. Some of it, it will help you to get the idea of the revelation of the joy of what God's leading you to. So when the enemy tries to get opposition, you can say, I can stop here or I can keep moving. Right. It's, like dry, it's like going out of town. I remember years ago, I was going on a, a road trip with my family and we're driving. And it was like a 14-hour road trip. And Logan was little. And you know, the first hour she was saying, as all kids do, are we there yet? Right. Are we there yet? Not even close. And you know what? When you're doing a, a, have you ever done a long road trip? When you're doing a long road trip, patience can slowly fade away. Frustrations could happen. Right? I just wish I was there. I'm tired of driving. I'm sick and tired of the road. I'm tired. The whole process. But you don't stop at the side of the road, do you? Why? You keep pushing through. Why? Because you have a destination. See, I have a destination. So the enemy will try to lure you away. If you don't know your destination, you'll stop anywhere. Oh, this looks like it. If it's not it, don't stop. If, it's not, if it doesn't look like it, don't stop. If it doesn't look like it, don't stop. Because the devil will try to create something that looks like it, but it's not it. See, he's, a, he's not a creator. He's an imitator. He even try, will try to appear as an angel of light. He's not, but he tries to appear like that. Why? Because he takes anything God does and twists it. And so he'll try to get, offer you something that looks like what God is saying. And he offered to Jesus something that looked like the will of the Father without the cross. Right. Oh, you don't need to do that. I'll show you a quicker way. You can be blessed without giving tithes and offering. I'll show you. You don't need to forgive them. I'll show you a different way that you can get ahead without obeying God. Really. And when you do it the devil's way, you might get to something that looks like God's plan, but it will be, oh, this looks like heaven. Yeah, but it's heaven without God. Right. That's the plan of the devil, trying to get you to bite into you don't need him. But when you are serving him, when you are in a real relationship, you realize that there is nothing, nothing this world offers that if it takes the place of him and his presence, you don't want it. I don't want it. I'd rather, I'd rather listen, David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper, doorkeeper in the house of God than live in the mansion. 
But he's not. But the, some people read that and say, well, God doesn't want you blessed. See, David. No, David said if, it, if it's between uh, being a doorkeeper or living in a mansion, I'll take the doorkeeper with God's presence than a mansion without God's presence. But God can also put you in a nice home with his presence. Can I get an amen? But his presence is key. The Lord God is your strength, your source of courage, your invincible army. He has made your feet steady and sure like hind's feet. Why? Because normal people walking on rocks, your, your step, your footing will slide. What makes other people slide won't cause you to slide. Amen. This keeps coming back to my spirit. I don't know who this is for. And anytime the Lord does this, it's usually for one, if not for several. But I just feel in my spirit that you, so, there's somebody here that you're on the journey. And you have opportunities, literally, like contracts in front of you, ready for you to sign. And they look good. But I'm telling you, you better read it again. The Lord said, read it again, because if it's without God, I don't care how good it looks. It's not going to be all that. It might take you down the wrong path. Don't be lured away. Don't be enticed for things that look similar. Well, God, I know you said this, but this is almost like this. As Sarah looked at Abraham and said, I know he said that you're going to be a father of multitude. Maybe it's not me. Let me give you a backup plan. And Abram, later Abraham, made the foolish mistake of saying, okay, sounds like a good idea. And later Sarah said, my sin be on you. And to this day, the sons of Ishmael fight with the sons of Isaac. If it, oh, that could be a back, are you listening to me? In the kingdom, there's no backup plans. It's only God's plan. Let go of the backup plan. Let go of the backup plan. Let go of the, walk away from the backup plan. Well, this could be God's plan. No, we'll do it a different way. You don't sign the backup plan. Follow God's plan. Amen. Amen. Well, that was free. The key word in this series is indomitable. Say indomitable. Of a, a strong, the Cambridge definition defines indomitable as of a person strong, brave, and impossible to defeat or to make frightened. I like that even better because there's some people that come out ahead, but they were scared throughout the whole journey. They come out through the fight winning, but then they were just terrified. No, I'm telling you, God not only wants you to win, God wants you to be strong inside as well as outside. Do you see that? God doesn't want you to be intimidated or nervous or your heart start beating faster or your, your stomach drop when the phone rings, when you get the mail and you don't know what that envelope says. God doesn't want you to, and you get a strange voice, you're like, who is this? And you're nervous because last time you got a bad news about the five years ago when someone called unexpectedly and now every time the phone rings, every time a holiday comes by, every time a situation happens that's similar to something you went through in the past. No, God doesn't want you to relive in your future the bad that the enemy has done in your past. And I'm telling you, God not only wants you to be free, he wants you to be totally free. So anything the enemy's used against you in the name of Jesus, I cancel its assignment. You say, how can you do it? I can do it because of the authority and the word of God. And I cancel that against you in the name of Jesus. I set you free because according to the word, whom the son has set free is free indeed. And I decree from starting this moment for that you will never have an internal, subconscious, emotional soul, whatever you call it, Tied knee-jerk reaction to the natural things that come your way. You will not be drawn back into the storms of yesterday battles by the situations of today. I set you free in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, give the Lord the loudest clap of praise. The next 30 seconds. Hallelujah. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. If you have your Bibles, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. God is talking to Joshua and he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. courage. Folks, if you're with us through the series and if you haven't been with us, these uh, services are all online, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. And I want to encourage, if, as you study the word of God, you'll find out, wait a minute, God doesn't want me to be weak. God doesn't want you to be timid. That's what's been sold to the religious world. 
See, I'm not into religion. I'm into a real relationship with Jesus. And there's a lot of people who go to church on Sunday. They have no real relationship. They're faking it till they make it. They have an outside appearance, no inward revelation. They do not believe really what they say they believe. They just talk the talk and look the part. And they, they think that being spiritual is being soft-spoken and being timid. But the Bible says God's not giving you the spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and sound mind. You can't tell me as you begin to study the word of God that God called you to be a sissy or to call you to be passive and weak. I'm I'm telling you, Jesus wasn't weak. All these pictures thinking of Jesus is soft-spoken. No, Jesus, are you kidding? He went and got some string. He got some cords and flipped over the money changers' tables at the temple and whipped them. And are you listening? You, the Sadducees and Pharisees, the religious of that day, were like the powerful people. They were the ones calling the shots. They're the ones with the police, and they could call in and they could have you arrested. And Jesus did not back down, saying, "Oh, excuse me, excuse me." No, he he would say straight on, "Listen, you are acting just like your father. Oh, we're children of." Abraham. If you were children of Abraham, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, if you were the children of Abraham, you would do what Abraham did. You are children of your father, the devil. That's some tough talk. That's not no kumbaya, let's all get along talk. Hallelujah. Back to this verse. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you whithersoever you go. Say, he's with me. me. The Bible in the New Testament says that Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. One of the reasons you have that wristband, if you you receive that and are wearing that today, this is tagged by God, is that you are constantly reminded, regardless of how you feel in the emotions of the day, if the sun's shining or the sun not shining, if it's cold or it's it's hot, if everybody loves you or no one even likes you, if whatever it might be, if everyone's helping you or people are trying to take you out, either way, Jesus is with you and you, because he's with you, you have access to his strength, his provision, his healing, and when the nurse or doctor or surgeon surgeon or somebody says something that begins to rock you at your core, you have a right to say in the name of Jesus, I curse that. Yeah. Now, I respect doctors. We have doctors in the house right now. I see them. I respect the medical field. But I've learned to, if people say something and it's like they are prophetically speaking, they might not realize what's going on, but I begin to feel it hit my spirit. I'll say out loud, and they don't, if they don't understand, that's not my problem because it's not between me and them. Right. I've looked at them and said, I curse that in the name of Jesus. Just because, listen, just because they're a doctor. I've been in hospitals, and I've asked a doctor. This is years ago. It was at Barnes, and I was talking to a doctor that was one of the top doctors in the Barnes Hospital. And this is many years ago. And he was the one, I mean, his ideas and, and, and processes they have implemented within the system of the hospital. He was an important person. And we were talking, and he began to say something that was in difference to another doctor. And I just said, excuse me, doctor, this doctor said something completely different. See, I'm okay. I'm comfortable talking to people and telling them that they're not saying the right thing. I, that might not be your thing, but I'm just like, hey, if you're going to stand on it, you got to at least stand and take ownership of it. And I said, this doctor said one thing. You're saying something different. Who do I believe? And he said, let me help you out. He said, there's a lot of white coats in this building, referring to doctors. Again, I respect the medical field. He said, there's a lot of white coats in this building. And if you ask them a question, they're going to give you an answer. But most of them are going to be wrong. Listen to me. That's pretty arrogant. But you know what? He was probably right. Because some of us are taking answers from everybody, thinking if someone gives us an answer, it must be right. My Bible says, let all, let all men be liars and God be true. Because he doesn't, Jesus doesn't wear a white coat, but he's coming on a white horse. And I'm telling you, at the end of the day, you got to stand up and say, wait a minute, I hear what you're saying, and I'm not being disrespectful, but that's your opinion. That's why even in wisdom, you go get a second or third opinion. And some of us got to learn to start with the opinion of heaven and say, wait a minute, you're saying this, God says that. Hallelujah. See, some of us, if we begin to understand that when God gives you a direction, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. Oh, I just wish God would speak to me more. I just wish Lord would use me. I wish God would do all these things in my life. Well, you're, I mean, some of you are living, not, 
no one here, just someone who's watching this video later. So, some people, some people in the church world live their life and think Jesus is the little genie in the, in the jar that they're keeping on rubbing in the lamp, hoping that he can fix the problems because their own mistakes and they don't want to do what he wants to do. They want him to be the forgiver of their sins. Is this getting too heavy? They want him to be the forgiver of their sins because they feel guilty and bad about the stuff they've been involved in. And they're beginning to experience, for the Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked what a man sows, they shall reap. And they're beginning to reap the sin effect of disobeying God and living their own life. And they don't want to change. They like being in charge of their own life. So they think they're in charge, but they're really not. And all of a sudden they begin to experience it and they're feeling bad and feeling empty and feeling uh, sad. And they're like, oh God, I need you to forgive me. They want God's forgiveness. They want Jesus to forgive them. They want him to be their, the, the savior, the forgiver, but they don't want him to be their Lord. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I ask you? See, you want the presence of God. You want the power of God. You want the provision of God. You got to begin to understand that it costs you everything. And that's not a bad thing. That's begin to say, I don't live for me. I live for you. You show me, I'll do it. Not somebody tell you God said it. See, the problem again, I keep saying this, but we need to keep hearing it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. Too many Christians are living on secondary commands. Well, God told me this to tell you, you need to. Just look at them and say, I love you, but shut up. Because if God didn't tell you anything they say, they're making it up. Wow, it's quiet. Do you know you have to grow in the things of God? Everybody does. Even ministers have to grow in the things of God. Even the gifts of the Spirit, it's a growing process. And some people get in like a teenager and they think they know everything and they're only 16 years old. And you look at your kid and they walk and strut around the house like they own the world and know everything. In the back of your mind, you're like, you really know nothing, but I can't if I tell you that. You, it won't help you. And there's a lot of people walking around the church world with titles and collars and they're so impressed by their titles and getting people to bow down to them. But they're like teenagers, they know nothing. Because they're more impressed, they, they're more impressed impressing other people and getting people to know their name than making a difference and being used by God to add, uh, oh, I gotta just back away. Don't you live, don't you live, listen, I tell you all the time, challenge everything I say because it's not Pastor Greg's word, it's the word of God revealed to you. You need to have a command from heaven. If you're living on someone else's command, that's secondary, it won't work for you. It's like trying to take the seed of somebody else's tree and say, ooh, let me take half that seed and I'll plant it in the heart of my life. And it won't work because when you fragment a seed, it produces nothing. Have not I commanded you, be strong and of good, good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you whither soever you go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, pass through the host and command the people, saying, prepare your victuals, or prepare food for the journey. For within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go and to possess the land, which the Lord your God gives you to possess it. I want you to notice a few things out of this text. Number one, I want you to notice that to possess the land, it was a process. Yeah. Amen. He said, three days we're going to go over and we're going to possess the land. The end result is the promised land. The end result is the manifestation of what has been promised to you. The end result, and like I'm, I am very, I'm a realist. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you the way I see it. If you disagree, I'll love you. You can love me. We'll pray for each other at the end of the day. Kumbaya. But at the, I want you to know something. I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you can't, if it's not manifested, that you haven't reached the promised land. You might be on the journey to it, but if you, if you can't spend it, you're not in the prosperity level yet. Right? You can shout, we can dance, we can get the scriptures about God wants you blessed, but if you can't write a check on it, you're not there yet. Because when it's a God thing and you get to the promised land, people who don't know God will see it in your life. We can talk about walking in love, we can say it, but if, if you're not able to do it and operate in love in a way that's beyond the natural understanding, listen, you're not there yet. Peace, joy, it don't matter what it is. Healing don't matter. Until the doctor looks at you and says, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God, but I can't explain the way what is one report says here and this report says this. I don't understand. Until you can't. We need, listen, we need to freak out some of the heathens. Don't you realize that? We, we need to shine in a position that it just does not make sense to those who hate God. I love the story where they interviewed the guy and they said, how did, how did Jesus do this? I can't tell you that. Right. 
All I know, come on somebody, once I was blind, now I... See, there's a process. There's a process to possess it. There's a process to possess it. There's a process to possess it. This is not a scratch off. This is not pull the handle and watch the thing spin and see if God's going to bless you today. There's a process. It's a part of the journey. You're growing in the process, but you have to understand for you to get to the promised land, you have to prepare some food. Most people don't prepare spiritual food for spiritual journeys. They don't think about that. Oh, I'll just get there. I'll praise God when I get there. I'll worship God when it's done. I'll read my Bible when it's, it, all, when I, it all makes sense to me. And you don't start the journey. We need to prepare food for the journey. Yes. yes. The ten virgins, five were wise, five were foolish. Why? Because five prepared the oil yes. for the journey. Yes. Right. Because if it's just the journey... If it's just the achievement, if it's just the promise, you've lost sight of the promiser. Because he'll never leave you and forsake you in the understanding you come through the process that if I'm facing Goliath or I'm sitting in the the kingdom and been crowned king, either way, he's with me. In the journey of the struggle or in the, the blessing and the day of celebration, He's with me. Yeah. I need to make sure he's with me. Amen. Second thing I want you to notice here is that there's three commands. Say three commands. Three commands. God's commanding. Joshua, Joshua is commanding the officers, and the officers are commanding the people. And any way you come through this journey, whatever level you might be in that particular situation, the understanding you must have it, it must be in line with the word of God. Amen. Don't prepare a spiritual food that comes out of ideas, comes out of trends. Let's get on Google and see what's trending today in the church world. You can find a lot of stuff that trends today in the church world, and not all of it's from God. Right. Oh, you know what's real popular? We need to do this. Well, we might do, do that. We might not, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't come from God, we don't want to. Right. Well, you know, and the offerings behind us, this is stuff that the Lord placed on my heart. Well, you know, tithing, that was under the law. So was obeying God. So what's your point? <laughs> right? Did anybody ever thought about that? Under the law was about obeying God. Under the law was don't commit adultery, don't kill somebody, right? So, I mean, are we, we're not under the law anymore, but does that mean we stop doing what God wants us to do? On well, I don't see it in the New Testament. And then read your Bible, Hebrews 7. It's very under, big understanding of the context of covenant. Anyway, so I'm leaving that alone. Some of you are getting nervous. Prepare food. How do we prepare food for the journey? Because I'm, I'll be honest with you. Here's one of, the, one of the worst things. At least you're doing something, but here's one of the worst things you can do in a battle. <laughs> Nothing there. Come on, some of you done this. Are you listening to me? When you're in the battle, that's not the time to find the instruction on how to use your weapon. People who go to battle and then say, where's the instructions on how to pull this trigger? How to load, how do I load this gun? As a bullet are flying over your head? Really? Now? Now? You want to learn how to load the gun? You say, well, the Bible's there to comfort me. Yeah, it's there to comfort you. It's there to feed you. It's also there to empower you. It's there, the Bible says that the, the sword of your spirit, which is the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. If we're not prepared, that's the importance of this relationship. Because if you've never, if you've never shot a basketball, the last time, the, the first time you shoot a basketball can't be in an NBA game. 
I don't know what's so hard. I watched that football game, the Super Bowl. <laughs> Get the ball, run. Anybody can run down the field. Oh, really? Have you ever seen how fast and how big and how strong? They might look like this big to you because you're sitting in your comfort chair looking at a camera that's looking down. But when you stand next to them, you go. And they're chasing you. It looks easy until you're on the field. But when you're prepared to win, well, I've never ran, and, you know, I'm, I, I go to the kitchen and back sometimes. That's about as far as I ever exercise, you know. I don't, you know, exercise is just not my thing. As they're putting pads on you don't for the Super Bowl, are you kidding me? You're about to die. Get your affairs in order. They are putting on what, they are putting on the pads and the uniform, and you look like you're on the team, but you are about to die, or at least spend a long, long time in the hospital. This is not going to go well for you. All they want me to do is catch the football that they kick and run it. Oh, yeah? And there are guys running full steam at you, and you got to keep your focus on catching that football while you know they want to rip your head off. Are you kidding? And you've never lifted a weight. You have never ran. You've never exercised. You're not prepared. Are you kidding me? You really want to get in that game. I know pastors talked about this. This is somewhere in this Bible. No, no. You need to prepare your food. You need to get the promises of God. Put them on your computer, put them on a post-it note, I don't care. Get promises everywhere you turn and look. Begin to see the word of God, see the promise of God. Don't pick stuff that doesn't relate. Relate to what you're in the battle with and build your faith. Strengthen your faith. Get that word in your heart. Get that word in your life and do it and do it and do it and listen to someone else. Do it. Preachers, listen to the word of God being preached to you. Begin to speak the word. Notice, notice, notice. You do it. You saturate your mind. Until the command of heaven, oh, I, I don't know what the problem, I prayed and then nothing happened. It's because the command of heaven's not coming to your heart. Right. Until the command of heaven comes into your heart, whatever you say does not make a difference. We quote all the time what James says, resist the devil and he will flee. But you need to read the verse before that. This is sub submit yourself under God. Right. Don't be a double-minded person. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, it says. Purify your heart, you double-minded. He will, he won't. He will, he won't. He will, he won't. And James says that don't let that person think they will ever receive anything from the Lord. Because they haven't prepared their food for the journey. They haven't prepared the food. Let me just jump to the end of this. Joshua, the verse 8 in Joshua 1. What did God, before he gave a command, this is what he told Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart out of your, talk to me, church. But you shall meditate there in day and night that, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make thy way prosperous and then you shall have good success. What did he, do? What did he tell them to do? Begin to speak the word. Hear the word. Day and night, get it in your mouth, get it in your heart, get it in your thoughts. Jesus said this way, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And then you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. We quote all the time, you shall, tell, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And most people have no idea what was being said in that context. Because it was not about you getting someone who's lying to you to tell the truth. It was about continuing in his word until the word brought revelation. Yeah. Then you'll observe to do. You begin to see what you're supposed to do. And then you'll have the truth that sets you free. Yeah. Do you see it? It's practical, spiritual, simple, powerful. It's so simple that you can say, oh, yeah, it's no big deal. And you don't do it. And then we are not prepared for the journey. It's not about you, it's all about him. Amen. Getting his word into your heart yeah. to make his will real in your life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We're done, we're gonna stop right there. Give the Lord a hand clap for praise.
If you bow your head and close your eyes, no one looking around, if you're here today and do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not asking if you know about God. I'm not asking you to join a church, denomination, or religion. I'm asking you this one question. Is Jesus Christ real to you today in a way that you do know, the way you understand, the way you process, the way you experience, that you know without a question or a doubt that he is real and that he's your Lord and Savior? Only you can answer that. If you don't, you can't. Romans 10, those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Let it come from your heart. If you do not know him, and I'm, if you don't know him, you know what? You're probably dealing with sin. You're probably dealing with the weight of sin. You're probably dealing with the regret and the, the heavy weight and the cloud of the enemy. He'll try to devalue you. He'll try to destroy you. He'll try to tell you that your future and destiny has already been wiped, wiped away and you've lost it. But I'm telling you, God is so good. He can forgive you. He can cleanse you from all unrighteousness, First John. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness, which means he'll, make, he'll clean you up, get you back on the right path. Fresh start. Say this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sins. I turn to you today, I repent. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to this earth in the flesh, died on a cross for my sins, was buried for me, and on the third day rose again for me. Because I believe that, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, wash me in your blood, forgive me, cleanse me, give me a fresh start. Say, Jesus, I don't want a religion. I want a real relationship with you. So I open up the door of my heart and life and I invite you in to be my savior and my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise.